Good evening. Tonight we have a special guest speaker, Mr. Roger Curry, who was involved as a litigant in the Paradise Dam case. Paradise Dam is approximately 80 kilometres southwest of Bundaberg. The Burnett River contained a population of a lungfish species, which was listed as a vulnerable to extinction under the Environmental uh, Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999. The Wide Bay Burnett Conservation Council sought a declaration and an injunction to restrain an alleged contravention of the approval under the EPBCA for the Paradise Dam. This case was ultimately determined in the Federal Court of Australia. The matter was litigated with a team of lawyers on both sides, led by QCs. Roger has kindly agreed to provide us with insight into the litigation. So if I could um, hand you over now to Roger, and uh, later in the piece I'll provide you some information about the examination. So Roger, thanks very much for joining us, and uh, would you like to share us some insights into that litigation? Yeah, thanks, John, um, and um, yeah, good e good evening, everybody. Um, the process came about because uh, the Wide Bay Burn uh, sorry, Wide Bay Burn Conservation Council had been set up originally with uh, John Sinclair, uh, based on the Fraser Island um, sand mining issue. So that group had about a twenty-seven to thirty-year history of environmental advocacy in the Wide Bay Burnet region, um, leading up to. Uh, 1999, we'd been closely following the, the potential for the Paradise Dam to be built by the Queensland Government because uh, Premier Beattie at the time had promised an election that he would in fact build that dam. So we were very keen to see whether lungfish could in fact be protected based on the fact that the dam was to be 37 metres high and that uh, effectively no one in the world had been able to create successful fish passage for lungfish. Um, so we were quite concerned. We, we argued vociferously with the federal government at the time to get lungfish uh, listed under the Act before the dam was approved. Uh, that subsequently didn't happen, but after the dam was approved, the federal government required that uh, the Queensland government needed to um, create a fishway uh, to allow fish to be taken from below the dam to uh, on top of the dam or behind the dam and that, that fish fishway had to be suitable for lungfish. All the scientific evidence we gathered, um, and bear in mind we couldn't gather government scientific evidence because it was kept undercover. They didn't want us to actually have that evidence. Uh, the, the evidence that we looked at with the court case was that there didn't appear to be any scientific evidence that the fishway was in fact operating correctly and or was suitable for lungfish, and that's given that the reports that were uncovered in, in disclosure were clearly indicated that only two juvenile lungfish had made it upstream in the fishway and uh, no uh, juvenile or adult lungfish had in fact made it downstream uh, while the fishway was operating. This was a $23 million fishway. It had never been, um, there was no model to build one. This was all new stuff. It was new technology that fish ecologists for the Queensland Government sat down and designed with experts. We weren't allowed to be involved in the design of that concept because at the point, that point in time, the Queensland Government was not very keen to let conservation groups um, be involved in um, designing controversial projects. So as a result, um, we basically observed what was occurring with the dam. Um, the alarm bells went off when the Beattie Government then decided that they would um, build Traveston Dam uh, on, the, on the Mary River because based on what we knew was happening with lungfish in the Burnett River, we automatically then tried to raise alarm bells about the possibility of a dam uh, on the Mary River, effectively significantly impacting lungfish in the Mary River. As a result, um, we were capable of uh, getting a really good um, community and scientific-based campaign against that dam to give uh, Minister Garrett enough evidence to effectively decide that the project should not go ahead. And that's a perfect example of the precautionary principle being applied uh, from the federal government, much to the chagrin of the Bly government at the time because they they were a little bit gobsmacked that one of their guys <laughs> could effectively say no to a significant state project. Um, the case basically was we decided to argue that uh, the fishway was not in fact suitable for lungfish and was in fact not operating. And they were the conditions of approval, condition approval number three was 
that the fishway must be constructed and must commence when the dam becomes operational and it must be suitable for lung fish. So we had the, um, the very complicated task of going to the federal court and arguing against the Queensland that the fishway did not appear to be suitable and uh, was not operating at the time correctly. And subsequent to Justice Logan's decision where our application was dismissed, the 10-year the reports that came out of the Queensland Government Monitoring Program clearly indicated that the fishway is not suitable. So whilst we lost the case, we tend to think we won the battle. Um, not that, of course, Paradise Dam is working now because Paradise Dam was effectively... All its operational capacity was destroyed in 2011 flood. Uh, was further, further uh, basically wiped out in 2013. It's currently cost $35 million to try and fix it up to get it all repaired again. I've been given an information from the Queensland Government that they'll have the fishways operating again by um, the end of June. So then we start again. Then we, we, we basically hopefully find evidence that lungfish uh, might be able to use the new uh, fishways if the new fishways um, seem to be... Uh, operational by the end of June because the breeding season is after June. So we're hoping it'll be up and running by June so that at least if there's some lungies that want to get up the top or get down, um, they'll be able to do so. But I'll have to say at the moment, the downstream fishway is positioned at uh, elevation 62 metres and currently the storage level of Paradise Dam is at 59 metres. So effectively the downstream fishway entrance is two metres below Table. So lungfish would have to be flying fish to be able to effectively get to the downstream, the downstream um, entrance, uh, and it wouldn't make any difference whether they could because effectively the fishway is not operating. On that, anything needs clarifying? Feel free to ask. The court case was quite interesting. Um, we basically had to raise $300,000 to pay for our court costs. Most of our legal team worked almost pro bono. They took minimal fees. Um, as a result, we were able to engage um, an SC and two barristers. And we used the Environmental Defenders Office in Brisbane to launch the case and to manage the case. Um, but understanding how it works, you, you would understand that we were up against the Queensland Government. The Queensland Government was prepared to spend a large amount of money to ensure that a, a tiny little conservation group could not actually dictate terms to the state government. So ultimately we lost, ultimately we lost the case, the, the application was dismissed. Uh, the White Bay Burnett Conservation Council was awarded damages or costs to the figure of just over $1 million. As a result, the group had to be de-incorporated. Um, we lost all our assets and um, more importantly, we, we lost uh, a group that had actually been advocating not-for-profit for at least 30 years in the, in the White Bay Burnett catchment, which, which is a real shame socially. But nonetheless, um, a core group of us have reformed a new group called the White Bay Burnett Environment Council. So effectively, we changed one, one word. Uh, and surprisingly, um, the, the Newman government has um, agreed to fund our group to the extent of $50,000 a year to advocate on issues about environmental matters within Queensland. And I, I really feel that, based on my conversations with Andrew Powell, the Environment Minister, that that's, but that's simply based on they realise we've been apolitical. And conservation groups have to, have to be apolitical. If, and, and environmental advocates need to be apolitical because you leave yourself very vulnerable to attack if you particularly want to take take on or support one particular political policy as opposed to focusing on protecting the species and arguing whether the policy is adequate to protect the species or it's not. So Paradise Dam has cost the Queensland taxpayers at, to date $600 million to build and operate. It doesn't make any money. It hasn't made any money. It has effectively stopped lungfish moving up and down and the steps spillway is in fact uh, a stepped concrete design which is called a dissipated design 
And it was designed to be able to dissipate the flows in the extreme flood events. So what we found in 2011 and 2013, that, that that engineering design fat at the bottom of the dam was so substantially destroyed that effectively the dam was under threat of collapse. And the Queensland government has had to spend um, approximately $35 million fixing the dam up so that it doesn't collapse and, and potentially threaten Mundaboo. Roger, did you consider appealing the decision or was it already so time consuming and expensive that you couldn't take it further? We did. Um, we had some serious discussions with the legal team about um, appealing. Um, it was based on probably a common sense decision to say, well, is it likely we could raise the funds to actually um, you know, facilitate that appeal? And what would be the grounds of appeal? They weren't really solid. They were a little bit, you know, shallow as you would know, John. If you appeal, if you've got a really rock rock solid appeal basis, then you should by all means proceed with it. I mean, we were lucky. Um, we, the citizens of the Mary Valley donated $100,000 to the campaign, and that's mums and dads and everybody. Um, and the other $200,000 came from us uh, appealing to the federal government uh, as a test case because it was EPBC and it was testing the third-party litigation issues uh, for uh, legal aid to be applied to the case as a test case, and we were successful at that. So I think Minister Garrett was pretty keen to see the case run and, and see what the result would be about third-party or conservation groups um, tackling uh, approval conditions that have not been met for certain projects. So I think it's a watershed case, pardon the pun, but uh, given that um, it's a significant risk now that conservation groups as third parties would have to take the, the risk of litigation because you will weak up costs. We were aware of that. We made that decision based on a meeting of the members and we've got um, unanimous support from the members to proceed at the risk of uh, facing the incorporation should we have lost. I think that's a fundamental flaw in the EPBC Act. I think if conservation groups, I mean, I don't mean groups like WWF who are actually corporatised, local community groups like ours, who are just a bunch of locals who volunteer all our work and we work for non-for-profit. I think that there should be some leniency in the Act about whether um, a local group that has standing can in fact then be vulnerable to, to costs uh, because essentially... We're the only ones who can advocate because we're the ones who can correlate the expertise against, um, in our case, against the state government, who were in fact the largest developer in Queensland at the time. So we're not just taking on, when you talk about taking on developers, we're actually taking on the Queensland government, which, which is the biggest developer in the state. So you can understand it, it's pretty much, you know, um, the Goliath <laughs> argument. And I, I have no regrets. I think we... We basically, um, we knew there were risks involved, but we felt so serious about it because, as I said, we'd spent a decade arguing to get the lungfish protected much quicker and arguing that a 37-metre dam was ultimately going to be very, very um, significantly impacting the species. And that's happened because we've lost, we can't actually ascertain the figures, we think we've lost thousands of lungfish as a result of the 2011 and 2013 floods because the dam was full, the catchment was saturated. The Paradise Dam uh, does not let its water out because there's no market for the water. So it continually stays full and the species is going to undergo a significant impact. So I think down the track there's probably um, opening for another legal case or a legal challenge again to look at is this structure having a significant impact on the species, which is all about the definition of whether you get approval uh, if your project is going to significantly impact the species. With hindsight, Roger, um, assuming that you were prepared to litigate this matter again, afresh, mm. would you change anything or would you change your approach to the litigation? Well, I think what we'd have to look at is what the argument would be. Um, I think given Justice Logan's decision, um, it would be difficult to try and come up with come up with an argument that um, Justice Logan aired in his, in his decision about suitability and or um, operational capacity, I think we'd be more inclined to tackle uh, the likely significant impact to the species, given that the Burnett catchment has 38 storages. Um, it's over-regulated. It's, in fact, over-extracted. 
And that we have, if we have a dam that sits where it sits and it's not being emptied, it's not being used, then the risk of significant impact to lungfish is probably quite likely. Um, and we would need to take that back to the court and argue that a significant impact is occurring and therefore the Queensland government should be held accountable for that significant impact. Mind you, the issue is that lungfish aren't keeping coming. Lung, lungfish uh, are slimy, uh, which not many people, it's, it's a difference between fighting for koalas uh, because people, oh, they're beautiful, you know. We fell in love with lungfish, um, but the general community doesn't see that. They, they're basically saying, what, what are you guys going on about? These are, just, these are just lungfish. Even though, you know, we know they're 200 million years old, they're actually our living dinosaur. They're much older than koalas. But it's public perception. So we work on that. We, tr we try to make lungfish cute. We do the best we can. Thanks, Roger. H how important was the expert evidence in the case? Well, I think if Justice Logan's decision seemed to me, he, he sort of basically, his mindset seemed to be that the Queensland government had two recognised experts. Dr. Martin Cooper and um, Martin Allen Cooper and Peter Coyne. And, Peter, and I know these guys really well. I, I don't have any professional issues with these guys. They know their stuff. And, and I think we just came from the position of we couldn't afford to get, um, or A, we couldn't afford to get lungfish experts because um, B, the lungfish experts had been engaged by the Queensland government who we were in fact taking to court. So it was very difficult to actually get a recognised lungfish expert to come out and take the risk of being seen to be um, acting against the Queensland government, given that lungfish are under the total control of the Queensland government, and that, and that we understand that because as an expert, you know, as an expert um, scientist or ecologist, you need to make that conscious decision, which is, are you going to go to court and argue against um, a potential client down the track who may actually want you to work for them? And if they have to look back at your CV where it says you were in court arguing against their proposal, that has ramifications socially and economically. So it was difficult for us to come up with um, really heavyweight expert opinion. And I think Justice Logan understood that. So his, his finding seemed to be that basically I have to take the path of the Queensland government because they have two um, recognised experts who have been involved with the process right from the start our expert was Jim Tate, who is a fisheries expert, a freshwater specialist, but not a specific lungfish specialist. What was interesting out of that case was that when he, he had his conjoint meeting with Peter Kine, they agreed on almost 99% of the evidence. So there, it was interesting that even though our expert was not classified as being a, you know, a, a cognoscenti lungfish person, um, he and Peter Kine had almost everything in common. So... If, you've get, if we were to, were to go back, we're going to have to look at engaging some serious um, lungfish experts. And interestingly, as a result of the Queensland government changing hands, a lungfish expert who worked on Paradise Dam is now a professional private lungfish expert who works pro bono for us. So we have one of the guys who was in the court giving evidence for the Queensland government now working for us. So things could change. Thank you. Roger, you mentioned um, the, the word standing before. Mm -hmm. the yes. Purpose of the explanation. Would you mind just explaining that concept and, and how it worked with you in this case? Okay, well, under the Act, under the Federal Act, um, if you're going to be a third-party litigant, you have to actually prove standing on the matter, which means you have to prove to the court or to the judge that you guys are not just, um, you know, you have to have a significant history of advocating on, on the species and then on, on environmental matters. And we could prove that because we had a lot of information to put to, the, put to Justice Logan to say, you know, Your Honour, we're not... Um, flash in the pans, we're a dedicated conservation group with at least almost 30 years of legal 
standing. So in other words, we, we met the legal standing requirement and Justice Logan had to agree that yes, um, you should be you should be allowed to proceed with the application. Does that explain yes. reasonably well? So what standing means having standing okay. means having the ability to put your foot in the door, as it were, to get a start. Yes, yes. It, it, it seems to be that it's if you can if you can prove to the judge or the court, the federal court, that you can meet the standing requirements then the, the court has to agree that you have the right to come to the court to argue your case, yes. And are you yeah, able you know, to... Sorry, sorry. Um, just a question uh, over the funding. Yes. Were your, it's Rodney here. Um, was your uh, organisation able to access any environmental defenders organisational funding or not for help? Um, they basically... They took the case on for us at a pro bono rate. So they actually, I think, essentially, the three we could only raise 300000 That's all we could get. And we went to them and said, look, this is all we've got. Is it possible to run the case with this? They basically went and engaged um, three barristers and, and had a discussion and said, look, this is all that they've got. Are you guys prepared to do it? And they said, yes, we are. So uh, EDO, at that time, EDO uh, was... Uh, except was um, granted funding from the state and the federal government, but we, we didn't access any of that funding. Our funding came from, as I said, mums and dads in the Mary who chucked in two bucks or whatever and bought chocolate turtles and chocolate lungfish and, and we got $200,000 from uh, the federal government because I we had to argue the case with Peter Garrett. I went down on a couple of occasions and, and discussed it with him and said, look, I think this is a really serious issue, Peter. It was... He was good because he, you know, with the background the guy had, he, he was, we cut to the chase and he went, look, I'm only going to be able to deal with this if um, you guys can give me an argument that this thing is not good enough and needs to be dealt with correctly and that you believe that the, there are issues that the Queensland government needs to face and that's what we did. We convinced him we needed to run this as a test case so he could have some clarity about, in fact, where the lungfish were being adequately protected at Paradise Dam and what were the ramifications for Traveston as a result? Yeah, okay. Yeah, John and Roger, can I just um, ask something? Yes. Just uh, when you speak about standing, um, and I'm not sure if this is correct, but was there a um, bill produced uh, in the Queensland government? I'm not sure if it's been introduced into the Act, but with the Queensland Environmental Protection Act, to all but eliminate um, people other than those directly affected, uh, I think this is in relation to mining approvals, um, as to whether they can show an interest in that, or whether they have a, a right to have an interest in that case. Is that similar um, to what you're talking about with standing? Well, I know that under the Federal Act, the Act says that you have the right to prove your standing uh, and you must sh you must show standing in the federal court. So the federal court wants you to prove that you're not just a vexatious complainant, that you are seriously engaged in protecting the species and advocating for the species, which did for us to pull all the reports and documents out and give it to the court. What you're saying, uh, commenting on, is the fact that I believe the Queensland government is currently in the process of attempting to circumvent uh, the right to submit or appeal against mining decisions. Um, and also, I know that the Queensland government, when they gained power, they effectively allowed uh, the costs to be instigated in, in the Planning and Environment Court. I think that's correct, John, isn't it? That now litigants in the Planning and Environment Court may, in fact, uh, have to deal with costs. Yes, that's true. I don't true. want to give these guys... And to give, yep. Roger, can you give um, uh, us some indication of the level of costs that we're talking about for these sorts of cases? Well, um, well, no, with us, the, the, we, we weren't awarded the level of cost that the state government was after because Justice Logan appeared to have some sympathy for us. Um, he reduced the initial uh, requirement. So effectively, the costs that were awarded against us were uh, one million and fifty thousand dollars, 
um, as, a, as a not-for-profit environment group, I think we had about four to $5,000 in our account um, and a laptop. And uh, that's what they got. So, unfortunately, the Queensland Government then uh, proceeded uh, for the incorporation of the group because they wanted to teach us a lesson. Um, and, and that's what happened. The group was de-incorporated. But as I said, the new group has been formed with one word changing. We currently have um, 16 members who are originally Wide Bay Burnett members. And we currently have life members of Wide Bay Burnett Conservation Council who still remain uh, life members of our group as well. Uh, John Sinclair, to name one. Mm. I mentioned um, in early talks that environmental law is, is a new area of uh, law and that where um, uh, most law is um, uh, subject to the interest of the parties, there is no um, law which provides for the environment to be protected as a, as a third party. And I made the parallel of uh, perhaps child protection proceedings where the courts routinely um, appoint a lawyer to represent the interests of the children at this stage, there's no law which requires the courts to appoint a lawyer to represent the interests, if I can say, of the environment. Um, so at this stage, we're, we're still relying upon uh, interested parties bringing litigation, but they do so at substantial risk um, to, to finance and certainly a lot of investment of time. I think that's a fair comment, Roger. Oh, definitely, John. Look, in our case, um under the Federal Act, um, we weren't seeking compensation, which is generally the case with litigation. You're seeking some costs or compensation because you believe you've been aired on by the, by the opposite, opposite team. Um, under the Act, we were actually just seeking an injunction um, to actually have the, the problem rectified and remedied. So we were after a remedy. We weren't after an actual um, financial gain, and that's the chagrin of understanding what we dealt with. We were there simply to try and do the best we could to protect the species. But the way the Act had been written, it um, doesn't give you the ability as a third party to not to be immune to costs. And I think seriously, I mean, you know, that, that's a flaw in the Act. And I gave evidence to the Senate inquiry last year in Brisbane arguing that case um, to say we really do need to look at whether... Um, serious third party groups and as I said before I don't I don't mean WWF or Greenpeace or any of these huge corporations that deal with environmental matters. I mean simply little groups, community groups like ours and like Fraser Coast Wildlife Preservation Society, who actually we commit uh, as not for profit and we try to do that without being extreme radical um, lunatics. <laughs> we try to be science based science-based advocates rather than extreme. Thank you, Roger. John, um, I just yes. wanted to ask Roger something. I wanted to step back a little bit. Humanist, he mentioned that they um, were not... Know, radical political <laughs> activists. <Yeah. laughs> that he was not entitled to any um, public participation. Now, from... And I, you know, having had to read so much stuff in the last couple of weeks, everything's kind of jumbled in my head. But I thought, um, I was under the impression something like a dam um, affects wetlands, therefore it comes under um, Commonwealth as opposed to state. So when the dam was built, there would have had to have been an EIA. Why? And I, I was under the impression by law, like part of the legislation was public participation. So did it not occur at all or did it occur and it was just ignored or um, what was the story there? Yes, uh, the Paradise Dam EIS um, contained a public consultation phase and a public submission phase. We submitted on that as well as many groups submitted on what we consider to be the flaws in the EIS and particularly for us it was lungfish. It was like how do we get lungfish 37 metres high and over a wall? So the EIS was there. Um, many groups gave um, substantial submissions under that uh, EIS, but what you have to understand is that um, the dam was being constructed under state legislation. It was constructed under the Coordinator General's Department, and therefore the Queensland Government has the ultimate say in how to deal with the submissions. 
there was no third party umpire for Paradise Dam because the lungfish wasn't listed as an MNES when the EIS was produced. We argued and we uh, submitted to the Federal Environment Minister at the time that lungfish should automatically be listed before the dam is approved so that the Federal Government and the Minister could make a decision about lungfish. What happened was the State Government was given approval to go ahead with the dam and after the approval to construct the dam was made, the Minister made an addition to the conditions of approval by saying that after you've constructed the dam and it's operating, you should have a fishway that's suitable for lungfish. If you've got an MNES, which is a matter of national environmental significance, which is which lungfish are and merry turtles are and merry cod is and there's is heaps, black breasted button quails, which we've got in, in the Harvey Bay area. Um, if you've got a project which is likely to have a significant impact on that MNES now and it's listed under the Act, you have to prove to the minister that you're protecting the species. We couldn't do that because the lungfish wasn't listed at the time. So Peter Beatty got a complete tacit approval to construct a dam and therefore all the submissions which argued against, we argued everything from economics to social impacts to ecological impacts, were basically ignored by the, by the Beatty government at the time because it was an election promise for the seat, uh, the seat of Bundaberg. So it's great if you can get the opportunity to argue we got that opportunity with Traveston Dam because we cut our teeth on Paradise. So whilst we had to realise we lost the battle with Paradise, the battle with Traveston was won because of, in fact, the failings of the Paradise Dam to, to adequately protect lungfish. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Because okay. the, other, the other thing that I was reading in your notes was, or in the notes was um, that... It was protected in Queensland, is that correct, under the fishing under a fishing act, but it wasn't actually classified. Is yeah, that correct? It's correct. It's always been protected under the Nature Conservation Act. You can't keep lungfish. You can catch them accidentally, but you cannot eat them. Um, so the theory is it's protected. You cannot take lungfish. And under the under the Queensland Act, it should actually it's not listed as threatened. It's listed as threatened, meaning it's vulnerable under the Federal Act. So only the Federal Act recognises the vulnerability of lungfish. The State Act and the State legislation ignores the vulnerability of lungfish. It simply is not prepared. No government, even the Bligh government and this government, is not prepared to change that legislation because if they do, it means effectively that you could never build a dam on the Mary River into eternity because the population in the Mary River is our most significant population in the Southern Hemisphere. So, so you're protected by um, by Commonwealth legislation, is that right? Lungfish are protected by the Federal Act. Uh, the Federal Act has a list of what we call MNESs, which is matters of national environmental significance, and, and that's also um, the Great Barrier Reef. Um, many species. What we do as conservationists, we try to give the federal government the science to argue that this species is under threat. It's moving up the chain to extinction and we like to have it listed as, a, as a, under the Federal Act to protect the Act. What's happening now is that the Federal Act is moving into offsets. So the argument could be here that we're, if we took the Queensland Government on, they might effectively be able to ask the Federal Minister to give them the ability to offset lungfish. Now, how you do that, we don't know. We really don't know. But it's possible because the law, the legislation allows offsets if you're going to impact a species you can ask the minister whether you have approval to offset the impact on the species. And that and that's everything from um, black-breasted button quails to um, dugongs to turtles, everything that's listed under the Act. Yeah, OK. Um, same question but a different approach. Um, from what I've read in all the information, it's saying there's, if there's a conflict between uh, state rules and federal rules, um, the federal rules should win out. But I just don't understand why this is not. Okay, well, um, the EPBC Act came in in 1999 and effectively since then there hasn't been too many cases where the federal minister at the time, the federal environment minister, has actually rejected 
an application and said, no, you cannot do it. The cases where basically um, someone, a proponent has wanted to create a development and there's been matters of national environmental significance and they haven't been able to effectively protect those matters, no minister has actually, apart from Peter Garrett, and when I say no minister, I mean the ministers after Peter Garrett, has effectively decided to reject the CSG proposals and uh, the port proposals, the barrier reef proposals, because ultimately the federal minister has to cop the political backlash of um, making a decision against a state government or against a state government who has um, a significant interest in these types of huge proposals. When you look at the CSG and the, and the coal proposals in Queensland, they're huge proposals economically. So for, for, an, for an environment minister, <coughs> a federal environment minister to take that risk, to use his power to actually reject a proposal, that's a huge political um, risk and the minister can't do it. It just means that very few ministers have done that and Peter Garrett's the exceptional example. And I, I would posit that potentially because Peter Garrett has had a history of environmental advocacy plus rock and roll, that he was prepared to take that risk. He knew the political ramifications of what he was doing and subsequently that's that's the way it's panned out. But the Federal Act, and now what we're seeing is, what we're seeing particularly because of the, say, the, the Paradise case and the Traveston case is that state government, the, the Newman government, has been really, really working hard and, and advocating uh, to Greg Hunt that the power for the Federal Minister, for Greg Hunt in this case, to make decisions against the Queensland Government should be removed. That's where we get into the bargaining tactic of... Um, the, the Queensland government would like to see bilateral agreements set up whereby the federal minister can't reject a mining proposal or a state significance proposal or uh, any proposal that's, that's got significant environmental values. They don't want the federal minister to have that power. And once again, when we're, we're in the position of allowing um, proponents to offset, we can then say, well, basically any protected species could be offset. Whether it's effective or not will only remain to be seen because effectively, if you're offset, you've got to be able to ensure that you're protecting the species' um, viability, its survival. And lungfish, you can't offset one lungfish. You'd have to offset the Burnett River because the, the lungfish exist pretty much in about 80% of the Burnett River freshwater area. So it's a huge offsetting program. I think the I think the government So the Federal um, Act. Yep. I think the governments are favoring the mining though, aren't they? You know, they they're favoring the mining over the conservation and they're just letting them walk over everybody. Walk over the farmers and the conservationists. That's my concern. Well it all comes down to the law, Lawrence. And that's the issue of um, if, you, if you're serious about it, then there's nothing better than environmental law to understand how it works. And environmental law is, as John said, is very new. It's only, only taken its relevance in the last couple of decades. So, so we're sort of like, we're pioneering it. We're not really sure if it's going to effectively work. And the, it's, really, it's really quite politically interesting when you look at the EPBC, the EPBC Act was actually instituted by the Howard government. I think at the time they may not have realised how the power of the Act, what the power of the Act could be. Um, but it's interesting to note that a, that a Conservative government, a Liberal Conservative government, instigated the federal EPBC Act and gave the Minister the power to make decisions uh, to reject proposals by large proponents and state governments. Now, I think they've come to regret that and now that's why the the new, uh, the uh, new minute or particularly the Conservative governments now are looking to really re rehash that Act and see whether that Act could be, um, some of those powers of the Minister uh, could be considered to be um, against the community because if the Minister has the power to reject these huge economic projects. 
uh, they, can, they could put an argument that this act is actually not working in, in the benefits of the community. It certainly work, may work in the benefits of the species, but it may, in fact, be working in a negative social way. Roger, thank you very much. I wonder if this might be a, an opportune time to um, invite you to make comment in some different areas. Um, yep. I'd sent through the assessment pieces and um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know whether you want to speak to any of those assessment pieces or not, but the students might be interested for your, th your thoughts and comments. Is that too broad okay, a request well, of you? No, no, that's, that's fine, mate. Um, based on... Um, I've read the um, the Cairns case, which is interesting because the justice there seems to heavily weigh on the planning matters, which is the conflict between uh, the previous planning matters and the fact that uh, the Far North Queensland a statutory regional plan and the uh, the Cairns plan at the time, I think the 96 plan, seemed to quite categorically show that there were questions over whether um, that development should be allowed on that headland. The justice didn't seem to take a large rating on the on the environmental matters. Um, his discussion seemed to be that, given that that Chenoweth and the other guy were, were quite agreeable about, there wouldn't be significant environmental impacts to the species listed and the ecosystems. It seemed to me that that uh, the justice was basically trying to deal with the facts of amenity, and or whether significant engineering works would be required, and that that was clearly in conflict with. Um, those planning documents. So as far as the environmental issues went with what would be the impact on the regional ecosystems and or species, the justice seemed to say, well, it doesn't appear to be major impacts. So the justice didn't seem to put a lot of weight behind the environmental impacts. He seemed to be more that, the, in fact, the conflict with those other plans could be substantiated. That's only my reading of it, John. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> no, thank you. And just to confirm, this is the Pretty John against Cairns Regional Council case from 2012. Yep. Does anyone have John any questions? A, oh, John, I'd just like to make a, a side note to that uh, about that case. I was Googling it the other day and um, I found a news article from last year, I think, to say that that approval has actually been subsequently approved on a, um, I think it's a far smaller scale. I think it was about 18 properties or lots, I should say, compared to the original 35 or 39 or whatever it was. But, yeah, I thought that was, uh, yeah, sort of progressed still and only till just last year. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Roger. Uh, if there's no other questions on that, did, did John, you... John, I, I do have a question, but it's not about the dam and it's not about the cans thing, but it is about um, the um, APBC... Act and uh, so my question is in regards to Abbott Point. Um, how is it that, uh, like, it quite clearly states that the reef is protected in the um, in the constitution? So how is it that that dredging is able to go out to the reef? That dredge material is able to go out to the reef. Well, that one is interesting because. It's, it's basically the same issue. The, the GBR is classified as an M&ES under the Act. Yeah, that's, that's so, what I think. That's really clearly written yeah, in the Act. That's right. It is. So the proponents would need to clearly uh, substantiate scientifically to the Minister that, in fact, the dredge ball would have a less than significant impact on the GBR values. It's about if they take that stuff out there and they dump it, is it likely to have a significant impact on GBR values? Now, those values are you know, enormous. They're from everything from geogongs to um, coral systems to seagrass beds, et cetera, et cetera. So the proponents are saying effectively they've surveyed where they wish to dredge and there doesn't appear to be a significant amount of GBR values. I think... Um, the opposition argument seems to be from the big conservation groups is that, of course, you can't control that dredge oil and we may see sediment plumes move in certain directions which could then affect um, GBR values such as seagrass beds or dugongs or whatever. So it's a really complicated issue. Um, the fact is the Act um, basically says you must show us how you will not significantly impact the M&ES, whatever it is. 
And if you can prove that scientifically, uh, then the, the minister is duty bound to basically say, well, I've got to give these people a benefit of the doubt, give them an approval with conditions, which might be the condition is you must monitor the plumes and if the plumes move further than, say, five kilometres or you may be uh, liable for a penalty as a condition of approval because then there could be a court case from a large conservation group uh, to say that uh, the approval condition has been breached and they would go to the federal court to argue that the condition has been breached. It wouldn't stop the dredging or the dumping, but it may actually serve as a lesson for uh, the Queensland government to realise that um, you can't control impacts. I mean, Gladstone Harbour is a classic example. They said, you've got to do the bum wall, it's got to be done like this. Well, they didn't, and the Gladstone bum wall. So despite the fact that the Act can put conditions of approval on, such as even Paradise Dam, you can't control the outcomes um, because Mother Nature and the species are, are not under control. You can't, you can't control them. So the Abbott Point's an interesting one. It becomes a huge political fight because, you know, we have this real strong focus on the GBR. Um, and and the two, to be honest, the two sides of the debate about the GBR are interesting because on the one side there's an argument that port facilities and shipping will lead to massive, significant impacts to the GBR when, in fact, we've scientifically proven that the biggest impact to the GBR at the moment is the fact that all Queensland catchments, we've cleared all the Queensland lowland forests for bananas and sugar cane, and that's what's impacting the GBR. So it's sort of to get a perspective on how do we manage the GBR, well, we're going to be able to manage agriculture on the, on the coast and on, on the Queensland terrestrial profile. And we've got to be able to manage mining impacts and we've got to be able to manage um, port and coastal facilities. I mean, the Sheng Neng uh, disaster was a classic example of what could happen. And the, and the worry now is that once we get CSG um, ships with 80,000 tonnes of LNG and we have one of those type of incidents, it could be disastrous and catastrophic. Hopefully it won't happen. But this is what we're up against, given that... Um, the Queensland government wants projects that create money for the state and create employment and environment can be seen to be taken a second position. Um, and then there's the, this argument of should the environment be given press and um, economic gain? And that seems to be the classic argument. One side says yes and the other side says no. And the precautionary principle doesn't seem to come into this argument at all either. Uh, Generally, it doesn't, but I must be honest and say that I think we convinced Peter Garrett that the precautionary principle should apply to Traveston Dam, and he did that. He looked at it. Um, now, one side of that argument was that we had to give him enough scientific evidence, and we did that because there was about 20 scientists working pro bono on that case to give him the, the evidence that he needed to, to be able to go to Anna Boy and say, look, I'm sorry, Anna, the science doesn't stack up. You can't do this. He also needed to be have enough uh, scientific evidence uh, to give legal weight to whether the Queensland government will in fact challenge him on applying the precautionary principle to that project. Fortunately, the Premier decided that um, she didn't want to appeal the decision and the precautionary principle was applied. But that's pretty rare in these cases, very rare. And the precautionary principle is very difficult to, to scientifically describe. I mean, I do this for a living. I have to be able to go to my proponents and say, look, there's an issue here. We, we might not be able to protect this. And you have to understand as a proponent, you may not get approval for this if we can't scientifically establish that, that the species can be protected adequately through your, your planning and mitigation processes. Uh, does that answer the question about precautionary principle? Yep, it does. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Roger. We really appreciate your time. Um, would you like to make any comments about the Vegetation Management Framework Amendment Act from last year? Okay, I can give you, I can give you a classic example we've got in the Fraser Coast. Meriba Sugar Factory um, is looking to uh, get approval from the state government under the new Veg Management Act to clear uh, huge amounts of land at, at what we call Colton, which is... Um, between Meribah and Harvey Bay. It's called the Colton USLs because it's unallocated state lands. There's 11,000 hectares in there, 
we've got anecdotal evidence that Meribah Sugar Factory might be looking at anything from 2,000 hectares to 10,000 hectares of approval. Um, based on the new Act, effectively, they will be able to actually go to the government and get approval to clear whatever they like in that footprint. Now, that footprint is effectively the headwaters of the Susan River. So if they were to clear up to 10,000 hectares, that would take out 80% of the vegetation in the Susan River. And that will have implications for the Mary and the coral reefs of Harvey Bay and the fisheries productivity of Harvey Bay. Um, but that's what this Act is designed for, the new, the, or the new regulations to the Act are designed to allow sugar cane to be, um, or uh, to allow, sorry, uh, remnant vegetation to be cleared without too much constraints to allow sugar cane to be produced. And, that, and that's a policy of the Newman government. They're really keen to see that happen. And that, that they've held, since the BD government instigated the Veg Management Act originally, uh, the Conservative government has, has spent two decades waiting for their opportunity to, to change it to what they want. And that's understandable. So now that's what we're facing. And one of the issues is that um, Meribah Sugar Factory will need to prove that the soils that they wish to farm for sugar are capable of sustainably producing sugar. There's no irrigation, there's no water supply. So I'm sort of, I can't understand their thinking when they're saying we want to be able to um, plant probably 5,000 to 10,000 hectares and we don't have any water. There is no water to irrigate that sugar cane. It will be rain fed. So that then begs the question of can they convince the Queensland government that they should be allowed to clear that area under the new legislation? Um, when there is in fact no capability to irrigate that crop. And under the new legislation, there's, there's, two, there's two requirements. One is that you must prove the viability of your project. You must prove that the sugar production is viable and you must prove that you have irrigatable capacity. So Meribah Sugar Factory, this case with Meribah Sugar Factory, is going to be very interesting to watch. And if you guys are seriously interested in whether, the, whether um, vegetation can be protected from agriculture in Queensland, this will be a case to watch. Does that mean that they have to pull down trees or cut down trees or...? Uh, Lawrence, it means that they have to bulldoze 10,000 hectares of koala habitat. That's a shame. It is. We know there's koalas in there. Uh, but, you know, the state government, they're not, they're not particularly concerned about, you know, um, arguments about protecting species. What they're, what they're interested in is actually saving the Meribah Sugar Mill because the Meribah Sugar Mill needs a million tonnes to remain viable and at the moment they're only getting 600,000 tonnes a year because every two years it's too wet to grow cane so they, therefore they can't get the productivity and the other two years it's too dry. So essentially there's sort of climate, inf climate change implications for sugar in the Mary and the Burnett catchment and this will be a very interesting case to look at. Um, is it, is it possible for this new legislation to come out with decent results or will this amending this legislation come out with negative results based on poor water quality for the Mary estuary and or the loss of biodiversity values as a result of these new amendments to the Act? So it's going to be a very interesting um, situation. So, so watch, the, watch this space. Roger, is, Wil is Mary Barra Sugar now owned by Wilmont? No, Meribah Sugar Factory is owned by Mitopol, a Thailand, a Thailand sugar conglomerate yeah, so that owns three, it's, three it's other mills. It's wholly overseas owned now, isn't it? That's right. It's wholly owned by Mitopol. Yep. So you've got an international company um, controlling, in effect, and having an impact on our, um, you know, <laughs> clearing that's going on for agricultural purposes within this country. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And and that's that's what the um, the Newman government particularly likes to see is that it, there should be less impediments to um, broad scale clearing as we refer to it, which originally was the idea of of the Veg Management Act was to save Queensland's um, vegetation systems out west. Um, but this government is determined that they would like to see that certainly loosened up a bit so that potentially sugar productivity and, and the Meribah Sugar Factory can be saved because that's a serious issue 
for the people of Maribor because the Maribor sugar factory is a substantial part of our economy. So I can understand their arguments, certainly, that we need to look at how do we get a balance of protecting biodiversity and allowing agricultural productivity to continue or to expand, given that we could be facing uh, water shortages based on, on the CSIRO modelling for, for our water systems in the Mary and uh, Burnett system. So... I mean, it's a pretty detailed subject, John, just that those it amendments, is. but I just thought that, is that, a, is that a good example of sort of saying to you guys, this is how it works? And no, I thought that was terrific. Thank you, Roger. Dave, and look, I'm conscious of, of your time and, and the time we've spent. Yeah. I wonder if we could just raise one last issue, um, and that's to do with um, CSG water, how it's regulated in Queensland and, and your thoughts in relation yep. to current regulations. Yep. Okay, well, look, originally when the concept came up with the Bly government, um, we went down and argued, most of the conservation groups, because there's about eight of us in Queensland, we went down and we argued with um, Andrew McNamara about the complications of CSG management, water management. And, of course, Andrew was pretty keen to go, no, 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 don't worry about it. We'll, we'll, we'll work it out later. We'll, we'll just actually do it and we'll work out what we need to do on the run, on the hop. I mean, we raised all the issues of... How do you actually know what your aquifers are doing if we don't have the data to say, okay, the aquifers at this depth, um, is it likely that extraction will, first of all, impact an aquifer, impact an aquifer's values? Because you know, fracking does impact aquifers because the stuff you put down as a fracking system or operation can lead to impacts on the, on the aquifer values. Is it going to lead to uh, farmers having a, uh, less access to their aquifer levels as a result of the view is that mostly where we're, where we're doing CSG is old sedimentary marine deposition. It used to be ocean. So effectively, most of the water that we're drilling into is probably anything from 7,000 microsiemens per litre to 24,000 microsiemens per litre. Now, 24,000 microsiemens is enough to grow mud crabs. So when this, when this water comes extracted off to allow the gas to come out, that water potentially holds, for every megalitre, you're looking at up to eight tonnes of salt. So for every swimming pool full of water that we suck out of a well, we're going to have eight tonnes of salt to get rid of. And that salt also has quite significant um, toxicants as well, natural toxicants, toluene, um, xylene, all sorts of stuff, because coal, coal is full of toxicants. Now, they predict that basically the figure for Queensland, we could be looking at anything from 500,000 tonnes a year of salt to 3.3 million tonnes a year of salt to be, to be dealt with in Queensland. So that's a serious issue because that's salt and, and that's salt is a byproduct of bringing the water up and treating the water with reverse osmosis to try and get everything out of it. So we improve it, try and make cows, or it could go to a town supply, or it could go to a river or a stream. So as a result, we get this huge amount of salt, and that salt's got to go somewhere. So one of the problems with CSG management is it's still the industry is still not showing how they are planning to manage that salt. It's sort of like they're just going, well, we'll do something with it at some stage. But at the moment, just give us permission to suck all this water out because once we treat the water, we can probably sell it to um, farmers. Uh, some farmer crops can use salty water. It'll still be slightly salty but not, not terribly bad. So whilst we can say that CSG water that's treated is beneficial use, we could get positives out of it. We've got to look at what would be the cumulative impact of releasing that water into the environment because essentially even if it's onto a farm, some crops don't use all the water, so you get you'll get that water being flushed off into our um, wetland systems, our stream systems, and the science around that because it's a, it's actually the companies doing the science. It's not independent, is very dubious, and that's what we've always argued is we need an independent assessment of of the CSG impacts. And currently in Queensland, we don't get that. We get the CSG Gas Commission, which effectively is a puppy dog. Of the, of the Newman government um, attempting to try and deal with all these issues because 
they've realised that uh, the farming community, not all the farming community is happy about CSG. I think they've realised that they've got a problem on their hands. I've heard just recently that um, they have got evidence to suggest that um, CSG gas is um, polluting the aquifers and it is um, with the chemicals, there might be some sort of chemicals that is polluting the aquifers. They've got proof. I've oh, heard look, on Alan Jones. <laughs> well, Lawrence, I can tell you that um, not all CSG is, is fracked. Um, some CSG is fracked. It depends on the quality of the aquifer and the pressure, the head pressure of the aquifer. But when they do frack, um, they have to send out a, a chemical concoction which they refuse to um, allow the community to understand and see. They treat it as commercial and confidence. So they have they have a huge uh, like chemical cocktail that they put down these, these fracking wells and they blast it down under enormous pressure to fracture the gas to get the well to get the the water to come up and they can drain the water so they get the gas. But the companies don't, by law, have to actually um, show us what that chemical con concoction is because it's classified as commercial in confidence because if British Gas tells us what they've got, then um, the other guys are going to go, oh, that's good, we know what British has got now, so we'll use something else or we'll use what they've got. So that's a complicated issue because you can understand the companies want to protect their proprietary rights, but in fact the community needs to have the truth and we need to be able to be you know, given the evidence to say, what's the likelihood of these chemicals impacting our aquifers? Now, the big question that comes out is that um, if if we go ahead and do do all this CSG work, and we discover that our aquifers are actually beyond redemption, we've actually done something that we can't repair. And given that some of these aquifers could have water that's up to fifty thousand years old in them, we may have a resource there that we've effectively um, damaged so badly we can't use it into the future. And, and that's the key question. Can we protect our aquifers by CSG uh, extraction? Is it likely that our aquifers may be impacted? Well, I think the evidence in America is pretty clear. Yes, it will. And it's all dependent upon how much water comes out, um, whether they can sell that water to the farmers. I attended at the first CSG forum in Brisbane back in 2010 and one of the guys got up there and he, he was from British Gas and he talked about how much money they were going to create for the Queensland economy and I, I asked him how much water did he think they'd produce and he said, oh, we think we'll probably produce about 150 to 180,000 megalitres a year. And I said, well, why don't you pipeline that to Brisbane? This is from the Surat Basin out around Roma. I said, why don't you put a pipeline into Brisbane? You could fill Wivenhoe up every year. He said, well, we wouldn't make any money because it costs us too much to build the pipeline. So their, their opinion was, we know we can do that and we know that we could actually give Brisbane water. We could keep Brisbane in water for, for probably 30, 40, 50 years. But they said, look, it's not. why should we have to pay for that? We're just here to get the gas. We're not interested in you know, supplying water to Brisbane. And, and that was unfortunate because we couldn't convince the Bly government to take that on and say, well, what about a partnership between you guys and them for a pipeline to Brisbane? Because that way you'll have water to supply Brisbane indefinitely and, and, and that could be a positive. But no, the governments, they, they're a bit reticent about actually going into partnerships, yeah. Roger, one thing that I think is a little bit interesting about the whole coal seam gas is there's lots of emphasis on the water and the aquifers. Um, it would seem yeah. to me, especially in areas like, um, so Miles and Roma, which are traditionally high wheat growing areas, um, what the food security issues that we have because once yeah. that land gets used for gas, it's no longer viable. A lot of it is no longer viable for food production. Yeah, absolutely. And that this doesn't is seem to be into the argument at all, which I find really interesting. Well, this is where the Strategic Cropping uh, Lands Act comes in because. The Strategic Cropping Lands Act was created by the Bly government to effectively restrict open cut mining on strategic cropping lands, which is the food argument. We need to protect cropping lands from open cut mining because that would just decimate um, our high productivity lands. But unfortunately, the Act does not restrict CSG 
activities from cropping lands. The argument is that strategic uh, that um, CSG activity is a, is a minimal impact to cropping lands compared to um, open cut mining, which is devastating on a huge scale. But you know that's that's not necessarily true because if the aquifers are damaged, a lot of farmers rely on um, aquifer supply. Uh, the condomine aquifer is the classic example. There's ev there's ample evidence that the huge CSG production capability in, in um, the uh, uh, Surat Basin is, is likely to impact the condomine alluvial system. Now, the condomine alluvial system is something like 50,000 farms rely on the condomine alluvial system to actually grow their food in the condomine uh, catchment area. So that's a serious question as to whether if CSG effectively is going to uh, you know, impact the condomine aquifer into the future. That is that is a food threat, I believe. Yes. Firstly, yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, Lawrence. Um, it to me sounds like that. Um, it's still coming back to the old cowboy issue of um, rip rip wood chip, and we'll get everything now. And, and um, bugger the consequences later, and so when it comes around, then they're going to cry poor and everyone's stuffed. And so it, and the, to me, it sounds like the issues that some of the governments uh, of the day um, have have more sense to say we will look at the future, but some some brands of uh, politics are, are just not uh, just for the here and now. Yeah, look, CSG came in really quick. I mean, the Bly government led the chase. They saw it as being, you know, a viable alternative. I think that's because they realised that coal mining in Queensland is on a downhill slope and they wanted to see another energy uh, source or a revenue source that was capable of sustaining Queensland into the future. So they saw it as being something that should be chased really quickly because don't forget that the CSG industries are huge corporations and they came to Queensland and they uh, met Peter Beattie and then they met Anna Bly and they discussed those issues with them and said, look, we've got a proposal for you guys and we need to have this some, some assurity that you can give us at least a chance to get this industry up and running. Even though there's no definitive legislation to deal with CSG impacts, and that's one of the faults we had, was we didn't have actually a serious CSG Act, which actually then could be able to regulate CSG correctly. It appears that what's happened is, and this is based on even if you, you watch the 7.30, uh, the Four Corners report about uh, Simone Marsh, who was an assessment officer for the Coordinator General's Department, who was given a document by her boss on the Friday afternoon and said, this is for a British Gas CSG project and I want you to come back to me on Monday and tick it off and approve it. Simone then went and met... Um, uh, uh, Drew, what's his name? Drew Hutton um, showed him the document, and that's when it went to the uh, Four Corners report to to show that effectively what happens is that these companies come into a state, they meet the premier, and they sit there and they tell the premier what they want, and that's exactly what happens. So these projects were approved without being assessed correctly, and that's because we didn't have any decent assessment process, and we didn't have any decent legislation to try and uh, manage and mitigate the, the impacts correctly. So we've sort of, what we've done is we've said to these companies, yeah, that's right, go for your life, guys, you can do this. And then look along the way, if it backfires and everything goes kaput, can you promise you'll try and fix it up? And that's what we're up against is they don't know. They haven't done the science. The theory should be you do the science. Um, you do the science on lungfish to see whether a dam would in, in fact affect lungfish and then you go to the to minister and ask the minister to approve it because you think you've shown that you could effectively protect the aquifers of the Queensland uh, sedimentary basins and that hasn't happened and that's really sad. And that's what we're up against is these companies were given permission to regulatory framework and we saw the, the Labor government attempting to um, catch up afterwards and try to do the best they could and then of course they've handed it across to the new government and they're having even more problems with it. But this is what we do as a society uh, when we want to get into our resources and the environment stands in the way. 
Thank you. I wish I could give you some. I wish I could give you some good news. <laughs> Roger, um, it, it might be an opportune time for me to to now jump in and thank you very much. Um, reading, you probably haven't seen the chat um, discussions at the bottom of the screen, but it's fair to say that you've got some newfound fans and um, we're all very appreciative of the information you've provided us tonight. It's been tremendous and I hope that at some stage you might accept an opportunity or an invitation to come back and join us again. It uh, really has been terrific. So from all of us, thank you very much. Most, most appreciated. Uh, if you wouldn't mind just staying on, Roger, for a no moment. Worries, John. Thank yeah. you. I just would like to announce something in relation to the examination. It's always of great interest to the students. To clarify, the exam is open book. Now that means that in the exam, you can take with you your textbook, you can take law dictionaries, you can take, take the study modules, you can take your own notes, etc. In fact, you can pretty much take in anything except a standard dictionary, a calculator, and some um, device which would give you access to the internet. So I hope that clarifies the situation and um, puts uh, people at ease a bit more. All right. Well, look, unless there's any further final comments or questions, once again, I'd just like to thank um, Roger for his great input and um, I'll stop recording at this stage. So thank you very much, Roger. Last thing. Last thing. Sorry. What, what was that, sorry, last right? name? Roger Curry. What was his last name? Curry. Yeah. Curry. Thank you. Roger, very good. Thank you. perhaps just before we finish, your your business, if, you, if you'd like to give us a rundown of that. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, I went back to Queensland Uni in 2000 and I studied uh, contemporary protected area management. I got a Bachelor of Science, Applied Science degree. Um, since then, I've created my own environmental consultancy business, which I see. I work with, uh, I work on both sides of the fence. I work with conservation groups and I work with proponents as well. I work with Merriby Council, I work with Bundaberg Council, I work with all the councils, I've even done state and federal projects. Um, I think I'm lucky because I've been a, a landowner uh, who was, we purchased a 40-acre block out near Bottle, um, south of Meribur, and, and it turned out to be a koala property, and that's when I was inspired because when I woke up one morning and there's a koala up the tree, I just thought, this is, there's something in this. I need to find out why this guy is up the tree in front of my veranda. And as a result, that's what I've done. So basically, um, if you look up REMC or you look me up on WordPress, I've got, and uh, the Wadbay Burnett Environment Council, we've got plenty of websites, plenty of information. And um, John, I don't mind if you, if some of the students particularly want to discuss anything full on that, you can give them my contact details. I'm quite prepared to talk to Thank anybody you. who's interested listen about the environment all right thank you very much okay, thanks guys we'll do that so thank you very much i'll end them i'll stop recording now